This is the story of the Logan Airport runway incursion on the 9th of June 2005. On the 9th of June 2005, an Aer Lingus A330 was to fly from Boston to Shannon in Ireland. At the same time, a US Air 737 was also on the ground at Boston, and it was bound for Philadelphia. The airport at Boston is massive. The airport has six runways. That day, runways 4 right and 4 left were being used for landings, and runways 5 right and 9 were being used for departures. Handling all of this traffic was a massive task, so complex that the task of controlling everything was split up. In simple terms, you had too many ATCs at the airport. The Boston Local East Controller was responsible for runways 4 right and 9, and the Boston Local West Controller was responsible for runways 15 right and 4 left. On that day, the West Controller was responsible for Aer Lingus Flight 132, and the East Controller was responsible for US Air Flight 1170. As the time for departure grew near, the Aer Lingus A330 made its way to runway 15 right. At the same time, the US Air 737 was making its way to runway 9 on the other side of the airport. At 7.39 p.m. and 10 seconds, the controller gave the all clear for the A330 to take off. The pilots of Aer Lingus started rolling. Just five seconds later, the East controller cleared the 737 to take off from runway 09. Both jets picked up speed as they went down the runway. The first officer in the 737 called V1. He then noticed the A330 who was starting to rotate. Something had gone horribly wrong. As both jets hurtled towards the intersection, the first officer analyzed the situation in the little time that he had. What could be done to avoid a collision? Do they try and take off early? Do they try to keep the plane on the ground? Do they hit the brakes? Do they turn the plane into the grass? So many choices, yet so little time. He said to his captain, keep it down, keep it down, as he pushed the yoke forward to keep the plane from lifting off. As both planes merged in the intersection, the Aer Lingus A330 flew above the 737, barely missing it. Once they had passed the intersection, the 737 lifted off with no issues. The crew of the 737 got on the frequency and told departure control that they had a near miss. A transmission came in from the A330 saying that they concurred. The report says that both planes were very close, and this is corroborated by an animation that was put out by the NTSB. At their nearest point, they were just a few hundred feet apart. At the speeds that those planes were traveling at, those distances would have been covered in the blink of an eye. The V1 speed for a 737 is about 145 knots. I know that it depends on a lot of factors, but let's take 145 as a figure that is representative of the speeds that are encountered during takeoff. At 145 knots, you're covering 244 feet every second. The A330 was even faster as it had already taken off. Had the first officer not had the presence of mind to keep the 737 down, this could have been very bad. How bad, you ask? Well, the 737 had 109 people on board, and the A330 had 272 people on board, for a total of 381 people. Yeah, it could have been really bad. But how could this happen? There are procedures in place to prevent exactly something like this from happening. As we talked about before, operations at Boston was split between two controllers, the East Controller and the West Controller. The West Controller was responsible for the A330, and the East Controller was responsible for the 737. Now, since the runways intersect, the controller needed to check in with the other to make sure that it's okay to clear a plane to take off. That was a way to make sure that both controllers are aware of what's happening and who's on what runway. This situational awareness is achieved through obtaining what are known as releases. For example, if you were controlling the A330, you'd get on the interphone, call up the East controller, and you'd say something like, request runway release EIN-132. The East controller would respond with something like, EIN-132 observed released runway 15 right. Now, the East controller knows that someone will be using 15 right, and he would hold any and all traffic on runway 9 
till the other plane has taken off. It's a simple procedure, but it works. So, what went wrong on the 9th of June? That day, as US Air 1170 was on runway 9, the East controller was busy coordinating his departures with other controllers and other airplanes. As he was doing that, he got a release for a Delta shuttle aircraft that was behind the US Air flight. Now, for the Delta shuttle airplane to depart, the controller needed the 737 to depart. So in this hectic cacophony, he accidentally cleared the 737 to take off without realizing that he had released the A330. With that small mistake, you had two jets hurtling towards each other. But what can be done to prevent something like this in the future? I mean, our airports are only getting more and more crowded. As they fill up, things like this are going to happen more and more. After the near miss, they reiterated the need to not clear a plane till the departing aircraft has cleared the runway. The next fix was decidedly low tech. If you released a plane, then you had to flip the departure strip of that plane till it had departed. Do we still use physical strips or is it all digital now? By the way, 2005 was 17 years ago. Why does it feel like it was only 10 years ago? They then changed up the rules so that the East controller could not have a plane lined up on the runway waiting for another plane to pass through the intersection. One more change was made. After a plane cleared the intersection, the West controller was now supposed to verbally acknowledge to the East controller with a transmission, saying something along the lines of XYZ plane has cleared the runway, you can now use it. But the true heroes of that day were the pilots of US Air Flight 1170, Captain Henry Jones and First Officer Jim Danahauer. They were awarded the Superior Airmanship Award by the Airline Pilots Association for their quick thinking and, well, superior airmanship. Thanks to their quick actions, 377 people never really knew how close they got to disaster. In a bit of good news, in the 17 years since the near miss, another such huge incident has not been reported at Boston. I guess the fixes that they made really did work. But even today, 17 years later, runway incursions are not a thing of the past. As per the FAA, there were more than 1,200 runway incursions in 2020 and 1,570 runway incursions in 2021. That's about four runway incursions a day, and that's just in the United States alone. The FAA, to address this problem, has come up with the idea of hotspots. Basically, they identify the areas that are prone to runway incursions, and then they warn pilots and drivers about heightened risk of a runway incursion at that specific point. That seems simple, but since no two airports are the same, the FAA has to compile this massive list with possible hotspots. That's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Let's see what it says for Logan International. And would you look at that? Hotspot number four, maintain vigilance when approaching runway 09-27. Looks like lessons were learned. Good job, FAA. What do you think can be a long-term scalable solution for this? I mean, having a hotspot list is great and everything, but wouldn't it grow too long too fast given how big airports are getting? What do you think should be done? New airports, new runways, more advanced or automated separation techniques? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. I know that this video is much shorter than my usual videos, but that's because I had to put this one out because I'm traveling and I can't make a full length video. But I still hope that you enjoyed it though. I'm recording this in 2021 and most probably you're going to be listening to it in February 2022. Is the world still on fire? Hopefully it's not. If you still want to watch more mini air crash investigation, I highly recommend this playlist on the Boeing rudder hardover issues of the 90s. I'll leave the link to that in the description and the comments. With that, I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.